Harley-Davidson enthusiasts and historians look back at the 1970s with, well, less than favorable lenses. It was a difficult time for just about every motorcycle company. Competition from the East had reached fever pitch by the end of the 70s. Harley was one of just a few non-Japanese manufacturers that were surviving at this point. And now the company had found themselves in the hands of a bowling equipment manufacturer. And let's just say most of the Harleys coming out of this time weren't exactly strikes. But during this era, Harley undertook a secret project to move the company and the entire industry forward. An undertaking that would place Harley-Davidson firmly at the center of the race for more advanced, performance-oriented motorcycles for the road. This would arguably be one of the most ambitious undertakings in all of motorcycle history. This is the story of Project Nova, a top-secret attempt from Harley to build high-powered, liquid-cooled performance V-twins that could have changed history forever. Now, before we go any further, though, I want to give a massive shout-out and a big thanks to the sponsor for today's video, which is Raycon. And I'm so excited to be sponsored by Raycon because I love this company. Now, I have had this blue pair of Raycon earbuds for years, and my wife and I absolutely love them. We use them all the time. In fact, just the other day, my parents visited, and after their flight, my dad was whining about how bad and painful the earbuds were that were given to him on the airline. So I told him that he should just get some Raycons, and even just for flying, you know, it would be worth having, because he likes to, you know, watch movies. They're affordable, but they're also really premium and comfortable, and they sound fantastic. These earbuds have fantastic noise isolation, and no matter what you're doing, whether you're running running or jumping or somebody's running into you, they just don't fall out. And he did not believe me that they wouldn't hurt his ears because he's never really used earbuds besides just like really cheap crappy ones. So I grabbed our Raycons and just shoved them in his ears really quick and he literally went, wow, those are amazing. <laughs> So now I have two pairs, and now my wife and I don't have to share them anymore. So whether you're needing an everyday pair for podcasts or music like I do, or maybe you want to wear earbuds to the gym, Raycon earbuds are the way to go, and they start at about half the price of other premium earbuds. So click on the link in the description box or go to buyraycon.com forward slash Bart to get 15% off your Raycon purchase, and they're already affordable. So this is a great deal, guys. Jump on it. And yeah, let's jump back into the video. Now, when I think of two companies that could not be further from each other in terms of just overall approach to building vehicles, Porsche and Harley would be these two companies. On the one hand, Porsche has been on the very cutting edge of performance car building, pretty much the absolute gold standard in just building raw, fast, great handling track and road sports cars. Harley, on the other hand, well, Harley has made some performance-oriented motorcycles, no doubt, and some sport bikes, but oftentimes they are built on the back of other people and other companies' ideas. Think those eras, you know, where they partnered with Ermaki or even Buell. But that did not stop Harley from reaching out to the great German manufacturer Porsche to see if they would partner with Harley to build their most ambitious motorcycle ever. Development for Project Nova began in 1978 in tandem with their air-cooled evolution engine that would, you know, go on to become the future for the company. So they were essentially building two engines at the same time. But these Nova engines would be nothing like the Evolution platform, though the Evolution engine would be a massive improvement on the existing shovelhead engine, making it oil tight and reliable and more powerful. This Nova engine would be literally an engine from the future. Over the course of about three years, Porsche would make quite a bit of progress on these engines with Harley's roughly 10 to $15 million investment, targeting Harley's desired specs and numbers. And Project Nova's motorcycles were to appear in two different forms, touring and sport. These motorcycles are fascinatingly not Harley and not your typical late 70s technology. Each engine configuration would share the same bore and stroke for ease of manufacturing parts, and they would also all have a short stroke, giving them the ability to rev out way past anything Harley had released to this point. The engine itself was a stressed member, meaning it wasn't so much sitting on or inside a frame, but the engine itself was actually part of the frame, which would lower overall weight. Think iconic motorcycles like the Vincent Black Shadow or, you know, modern Ducati sport bikes. Even some of Harley's early models, however, used the engine as a stressed member. And at this point, the engines were meant to be adaptable and able to be redesigned. For example, the early setup was two valves per cylinder, but they could easily redesign it 
to move to four valves per cylinder. Carbs were again initially used, but the idea of a transition to fuel injection down the road would be made pretty simple by the way that Porsche was designing these engines. Interestingly enough, it appears Harley was about 50 years ahead of its time with fake fins. That's right, this was a retro motorcycle, meant to look air-cooled to keep the Harley people happy, but it was actually liquid-cooled. So, suck it, Triumph. You may have invented the Farburator, but Harley invented the fair-cooled engine? Faux air-cooled engine? I, I don't know. Porsche was tasked not only with the engine development, but also the five-speed transmission. Personally, even by the late 70s, that seems to be lacking a gear. I don't know why a motorcycle this powerful and this fast would not have six speeds, but yeah. While Harley took on the chassis and overall just design and bodywork, and Porsche was not doing all the work here, this chassis and bodywork was a radical departure for Harley at this time. This radical design from Harley would put the fuel tank and the radiator under the seat, while what appears to be the fuel tank is actually a housing for things like electronics, very similar to, say, a modern Indian FTR, actually. Now, this decision to hide the radiator in this way is genius, and I think this is something heritage-focused models actually need even today. Harley knew that if they were going to make a liquid-cooled engine, they couldn't just have this gigantic radiator right out there in plain sight. I'm looking at you, BSA Gold Star, because that kills the whole vibe and the whole idea of heritage. So again, they hid it under the seat along with the gas tank. This fairing was designed and developed in a wind tunnel with airflow and aerodynamics at the forefront, and really the goal was to just minimize overall drag as much as possible. This fairing also held an electronic induction fan that would basically push air to the radiator even at idle. This whole setup meant that filling the gas tank would have to take place at the rear of the bike, namely the side of the back fender. Analog instruments were used including a tack, speedo, and clock, and you know, all of this was just way ahead of its time. In many ways, this motorcycle would have sort of new car technology through this partnership with Porsche. This bike was in many ways kind of on par with the technology of a modern car during its time. When you put all of this into perspective, Harley was proposing three engines to be developed by Porsche, all of them liquid-cooled, all of them overhead cam, 60 degree, in V-twin, V4, and even V6 form, with goals of, listen to this, upwards of 135 horsepower. I mean, Harley's new Sportster S doesn't even make that much horsepower. For perspective, the most powerful Japanese bikes around the end of the 70s were making somewhere around 85 horsepower, although 78 does mark the first year of the six-cylinder Honda CBX, which did make just over 100 horsepower. And that was in and of itself a motorcycle that seemed to be straight out of the future, it was the first production motorcycle to breach 100 horsepower, but Harley was targeting stratospheric numbers for power with these engines and hoping to utilize a V4 setup even before Honda would get to making V4s. Now, I think many believe that Project Nova was just some prototypes, you know, little more than ideas on paper, but Harley had invested massive amounts of money and time into Project Nova, along with much new tooling, just to be able to produce these futuristic machines, and many of the models were a reality by the end of the project's time. They were tested, they were being ridden here in America. Harley's dream of once again being on the forefront of motorcycle innovation and development was becoming a reality, but other forces were at work. Remember how we talked about Harley essentially being in its sort of dark years under AMF ownership at this time? Well, in 1981, Harley-Davidson became well, Harley Davidson again, in part thanks to the famous Willie G. Davidson. As much as a lot of good was done at this point when Harley took back over, to really take Harley Davidson into its own strange but successful history, or future at this time, decisions were made that would ultimately kill Project Nova. Like instead of focusing on creating machines that truly competed with the very best the Japanese could import, instead they invested in political moves to get tariff protection on large displacement motorcycles made in America. I guess if you can't make a better product, you know, just make it impossible for your competition to undersell you. The idea behind this was that Harley would get their act together, you know, modernize their tooling and lineup to be able to compete with the rest of the world in their home market, 
But what's fascinating is that Harley didn't turn to Project Nova as their future. Instead of making motorcycles that actually could compete with the best bikes coming out of Japan, they decided to focus on making, you know, unique in terms of history, but heritage focused motorcycles, leaning into the identity that they're now consistently trying to shake themselves from. Management decided to shelf the Nova bikes and engines left to live out their lives in the Harley Museum to just basically be, you know, a picture of what could have been. Instead of being actual motorcycles on American roads and potentially on roads all over the world, the air-cooled Evolution engine platform appeared to be the best choice at this time, and in some ways, looking back, it does seem to be the decision that makes the most sense, but we really will never know what would have happened if Harley had went with Project Nova. But sitting and debating about whether the Nova engines and bikes would have been the better option or whether they would have competed with the most advanced bikes of this era, well, it's pointless, you know, there's really no way to know. I actually find this story fascinating for another reason, because I feel like it tells us a lot about Harley. Everything we know about Project Nova points to a Harley Davidson that really was looking forward, if not in their own strange and somewhat misguided way. It was almost as if Harley wanted a backup plan, a sort of, you know, small innovation in terms of their engine development with the Evolution, while simultaneously building this crazy engine and motorcycle platform, not really wanting to go all in on a future building plan to minimize risk. Now this mentality is just so different from what we see from, say, Honda from the very beginning. Honda has always been willing at every turn to take huge risks and really believe in their own R&D. Whereas Harley not only isn't doing their own R&D with Project Nova, they weren't willing to go all in on their own project and instead they ended up choosing the safe option. But you just still can't compare this kind of investment to the hard work and R&D that Honda and Suzuki and Yamaha and Kawasaki did throughout the 60s, 70s, and 80s, or you know even Ducati in the last 20 years. Because those are companies that actually went all in on innovation. The most difficult and important parts of this project, of Project Nova, was almost entirely outsourced to Porsche you know, to another company. At its core, as the engine really is the heart of the motorcycle, and it's especially the heart of Harley-Davidson motorcycles, this was a Porsche project, not a Harley one. So in the end, the hard work to actually innovate long-term and build on their own innovation and what is learned along the way, none of that would have happened, even if Harley had stuck with Project Nova to the end because it's not Harley that's making them. In the end, when you look closely at Harley's history and the way they've dealt with competition, and an ever-changing market even today as the company plans to take itself into the future once again with liquid-cooled engines, one has to wonder if trying and failing to innovate and to be leaders on any front isn't just as much a part of Harley's DNA as, you know, leather and tassels.